Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. Do you fancy learning some fun and curiously interesting information? Well, in this video I'm going to share with you 10 common phrases in the English language idioms and their rather unusual origins. So, without further ado, let's buckle up and take a romp back through linguistic into history. Oh, for goodness sake, won't you put a sock in it? I don't know if you've ever used that expression. It's quite a common one. Um, put a sock in it basically means to tell someone to shut up or to be quiet or to stop talking. When you've got someone who's either going on a rant or maybe they're loud and overbearing or maybe they're just boring but they won't stop talking about a particular topic, you can say to them or to someone else, I wish they'd put a sock in it. Now, where does that phrase come from? You know, is there something nefarious in the dealings of the English-speaking people in the past where they rammed socks into people's mouths to shut them up? Of course, it can be done if you're gagging somebody, but that's not where it comes from. The actual origin comes from the early 20th century and the gramophone. You see, the gramophone, as you've probably seen in pictures, you play the record, the horn picks up the sound and amplifies it into the room. There is no volume knob. So imagine... You've got your music, you want to play it, but unfortunately, everybody else in the house can hear it, or at least in the next door or the room above where they may be trying to sleep. And so, how do you control the volume? You put a sock in the horn. So put a sock in it means to quiet, quieten it down a little bit. Thank you very much. And from that, it came into the popular usage of when someone is talking too much, could you put a sock in it? In other words, stop. Go quiet, please. Our next fascinating idiom is a red herring. Now, the idiom itself means a false lead, a deceptive clue, or just a piece of information that is leading you off track. So we often use the phrase a red herring in a murder mystery. You know, the, the butler's got a gun in the pantry and that seems to set him up as being the villain. But actually, it's a red herring. It has nothing to do with the real murder that took place. But how on earth did a particular coloured fish end up meaning a false lead or false evidence? Well, there's, like with all phrases, there's a bit of, you know, argument about this. There's a couple of ones. One of them, first of all, I'll explain what a herring is. Herring is a fish and a red herring is a smoked herring, what is called a kipper. When you smoke a herring to preserve it, it turns the flesh red and it's very, very pungent, like really stinky. Now, back in 1807, a pamphleteer and writer called William Cobbett wrote a story in, in one of his pamphlets, which told of how he and his sister, when they were young, used to put a red herring or a kipper on a piece of string when the hounds were trying to chase the hares and they would drag the herring through the grass and the hound would pick up the scent of the red herring or the kipper and follow it and the hare would get away. Now that's the idea, but many etymologists seem to think it's unlikely that just this one story would have caused the acceptance of the expression a red herring. Rather, that story may have been an example of a more common practice. It's thought that when training dogs to do the hunting, what they would do with young dogs is they would drag a red herring, a smoked kipper, this smelly fish, through the grass and the, tr the track to stop him getting um, deceived by that smell and teach the dog to keep its nose on the correct scent so that it would go after the correct prey, so not to be led astray. And so it eventually became to lead something astray, you were to be led off with a red herring. One thing I have to say here, which made me marvel at language itself, is the rhythm of the word a red herring fits with a misleading clue. Whereas if you use the word kipper, which is also what a red herring is, it wouldn't. Imagine saying that the butler's gun in the pantry was a kipper. Um, it would have a totally different meaning, wouldn't it? it? Just wouldn't sound like a misleading piece of evidence. Our next idiom is that delightful, it's raining cats and dogs. Naturally, that can't be a literal meaning because, well, can you imagine the scaffolding structure you would need in an umbrella? <laughs> if it really was raining cats and dogs. the What it actually means is it's raining very heavily, almost deluginous um, in, in the amount of rain that's coming down. 
Now, as with a lot of idioms, etymologists really do argue about this one. It may even be that it's just a quirky and funny expression that was picked up and passed along. Although there are some thoughts that it does have a meaning uh, that, that it comes from. One of them, which is a spurious idea, which you may have heard, and etymologists pretty much reject this, is that back in the cold weather in the old days, cats and dogs used to go into the thatched roofs, the straw roofs of houses to keep warm. But when it chucked it down with rain, they came out and jumped down. And so from your window, it looked like it was raining cats and dogs. But that's pretty much um, not accepted. What is more likely is that when it's raining in such a heavy state, Back in the day when either villages didn't have sewers, towns didn't have sewers, or the sewerage system wasn't very good, the amount of water coming down would flood very quickly in the streets and from the rubbish piles or from in the sewers themselves, dead cats and dead dogs which had been cast aside would be floated up and they'd wash down the street and hence the term, it's raining cats and dogs, meaning it's seriously heavy weather that can flood a place and bring out the corpses of animals. This expression is found all over the place, by the way. It's not just in Britain. Um, I think it's over in Hungary. I think it's, it's raining frogs and toads, where you can imagine how many frogs and toads come out when it's been raining like that. Um, there's, I think, Cata, the, the Catalan region has something similar about raining dogs, or I think even one place has raining donkeys. Um, again, maybe floating a corpse down the street. So there you are. When it's raining cats and dogs, yeah, it means it's pretty heavy weather out there. The next idiom on the list is one I really like, and it is to steal someone's thunder. To steal someone's thunder um, means to sort of take their glory, take their idea and present it as your own before they get the chance to. So you may have come up with a brilliant solution to a problem. You've told a friend and that friend announces it to everybody and they get the plaudits. You've stolen someone's thunder. But where on earth does that expression come from? What would make you think that? You may want to head back into Greek mythology and think about Zeus throwing his thunderbolts. Now, Prometheus stole fire, didn't he? Did someone go up and nick Zeus's thunder and pass it on? You know, reasonable. However, that's not where the origin comes from. The origin comes from the early 18th century, so the early 1700s, when one John Dennis, a playwright, was trying to promote his play, get the, the theatre owners to put on his play. And of course, special effects are a big thing, they are today. He had invented a device to create more realistic thunder in the play as a sound effect, but they wouldn't put on his play because it was rubbish. Later, apparently, he heard that Macbeth had been put on as a play, and they had used his thunder machine. Someone had caught an idea from what it looked like and they had designed it. And he, either in a pub amongst other playwrights or out of a carriage, no one really knows, shouted, they won't put on my play, but they'll steal my thunder. And you can imagine saying that around a bunch of playwrights, they're gonna be like, that's a good line, stole his thunder. And that's where it came from. Poor old John Dennis really did have his thunder stolen. The next idiom is one that has been around for a long, long time and is still used today, and that is crocodile tears. You know, you may say to someone, oh, give up the crocodile tears. What it means is hypocrisy. It is putting on a show of being sorry when you're not truly sorry. Now, this, this idiom, which will get its origin in a minute, is sometimes attributed to Shakespeare, but it's not from Shakespeare. He does use it in Othello, when Othello finds out or thinks Desdemona has been cheating on him. He says, if that the earth would teem with woman's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile. But he didn't come up with it. It's just, that's where we find it. Um, you can trace this, apparently, quite a long way back into antiquity. So uh, I'm trying to remember, is it Pliny or Plutarch? Plutarch probably, um, who talks about this. Um, they discovered that crocodiles do cry, but it had been noticed that the tears on crocodiles could also be there when they were eating something, which gives you the idea of you're doing something bad and feigning that you're sorry for it. So crocodile tears. Now crocodiles do use tears um, when they've been out of the water for any length of time, they, they need to cleanse their eye and, um, and moisten the eye. It has been thought and observed that when eating a human, 
The reflex for the tears can be triggered and hence crocodile tears. You're killing a human while pretending to look sorry for it. But the one that really promoted this in the English speaking world was a fellow called Sir John de Mandeville, who wrote a travel log in the Middle Ages in which some rather remarkable <laughs> things are stated, although some true. Um, and that's what popularized the idea of crocodiles crying whilst eating a human being. And so naturally, when you feign sadness over something, you are said to be shedding crocodile tears. The next idiom up is not used so much anymore, but is all over the Western films of Hollywood in the 1950s. And that is, you son of a gun, right? <laughs> you might think it's linked to revolvers and the Westerns, but it's not. Son of a gun um, is... It's a slur. It's a slur against someone. It's questioning the legitimacy of their birth. It's a softer way of saying the B word. And it comes actually way back in the Royal Navy. So on board the Royal Navy ships, you were not supposed to have women, um, but sometimes they were smuggled on. Um, sometimes they were taken on board for whatever reason. And often, not often, sometimes you could find one of them pregnant by the, the end of the journey. Um, so something naughty had gone on below decks. Now, what was permitted, and I was told this by the guide on the HMS Victory in Portsmouth, um, what was permitted is a girl who got herself into trouble like that, she could give birth on the ship, she could even come back onto the ship to give birth, and she'd be put below decks, obviously. Well, below decks is where the guns are. She would give birth, and then when filling in the form that a child had been born, you'd have the mother's name, and then it would say father, and you would have to write a father's name. But because no one's gonna own up, because they would be severely disciplined for getting a girl pregnant on Her Majesty's ships or His Majesty's ships, they used to put in the place a father gun because she gave birth in the gun decks. And so an illegitimate boy would have been called son of a gun. Now, obviously it'd be daughter of a gun as well, but the, the, the slurs were often thrown about amongst the sailors who obviously were predominantly men. So you son of a gun was basically a swear word in its day. The next idiom on our list is a very widespread one now and somewhat used comedically, and it is to kick the bucket, which means to die. Um, it's where you get the phrase bucket list from. Uh, you do a list of things before you kick the bucket. Now, how on earth do you get death from kicking the bucket? Very intriguing. There are a lot of different ideas for this. Not all of them are true. Um, and I'm no professional, but I've done some research from etymologists. Um, one gives you the idea that the priest would put um, a, a little bucket at the feet of a dying person and the family could sprinkle that water on their feet or cool them down. But when they died, they stretched out and they'd kick the bucket and they'd be dead. That's spurious. You may have heard of it, but it's not really that accepted. Another one talks about a penny dreadful. This is the, the pamphlets that used to be written in the early 1900s, uh, 1800s about you know, the gruesome goings on in prisons and executions and all that kind of stuff. And one of them contains a story of a man called Bolsover, that's his surname, who determined to end his own days and stood upon a bucket to set himself up and then kicked the bucket from under him when he was strung. That's another idea. However, the most likely, uh, likely origin of this phrase comes from the region of Norfolk. You see, all areas have their, um, what's the word, their dialects. And in the east of England, bucket can mean beam, as in a beam. I was once in Norfolk and I was walking out of a door and the guy there said, mind the bucket on your way out. And I looked on the floor for the bucket and banged my head on the beam that was in front of me. And um, because to me, a bucket is you know, a container. But bucket means beam in some dialects. Now, they used to hang a pig for slaughtering from the bucket. And um, when it was slaughtered, obviously, its legs would go and would be kicking at the bucket, as in kicking at the beam. So it was, you know, they probably would have observed, all oh, it's kicking the bucket, trying to get away. And it meant your comeuppance was come. Um, the word bucket for beam is actually used by Shakespeare um, when he talks about someone going on the gibbet of the brewer's bucket. And there he's talking about an actual beam. So that's where we get kick the bucket from. It's an actual beam on which pigs were slaughtered and would kick in their throes. 
The next idiom absolutely delighted me when I found out its origins because it's a phrase I've used my whole life, like many of you watching will have, and often thought, I wonder how we got that phrase, and it is, I heard it through the grapevine. Yes, also the title of that great Marvin Gaye song. Now, heard it through the great grapevine, you could imagine, as I did, um, people in the vineyards listening to conversation in the, the next row through the leaves and, you know, passing it along, heard it through the grapevine. It's got nothing to do with that. It actually comes from the Placerville and Humboldt Telegraph Company. So um, a Colonel B was issued the job of setting up a telegraph line from Placerville, San Francisco, over to Nevada. And we're told by a writer called Shin that what happened is he strung the cable from tree to tree. Some say because the rock beneath was too impenetrable to put telegraph poles. And they were strung through pines. Some say it looked like the grapevine tendrils just hung up. But Shin tells us that because of the winds over the Nevada mountains, it, the pines stretched the cable back and forth until it hung down onto the floor in loops, um, looking like the trailing tendrils of a California grapevine. And what actually happened was this meant it kept breaking and messages f issued through that telegraph were unreliable. It may never get there. In fact, we're told that the postal service, the Pony Express, used to get to Sacramento before a telegraph could ever get there because it kept breaking. And so to hear it on the grapevine, this particular, it came to be known as the grapevine line, um, meant unreliable information. And it caught on as an expression to the point that false rumor in the Civil War was called hearing it on the grapevine telegram. In other words, it's unreliable. So when Mr. Marvin Gaye um, complains that he's heard from his, you know, he's heard about his lover, that she's planning on making him feel blue and he knows it because he's heard it on the grapevine, actually, he would have done well not to trust that rumor at all because it means not just gossip, but very unreliable gossip. In fact, he would have been better if he focused his attention on the postal service. And so maybe, <laughs> maybe he could rewrite the lyrics and I'll help him here. The thing that gets on my nerves is, and I heard this through the postal service, I know what the word out there is, you're going to leave me for another guy. There you go, Marvin. I've helped you get a much more reliable source for rumour, which you can put into your song. <laughs> I heard it through the postal service. Our next idiom is, it really gets my goat. Now, <laughs> I love this expression. Um, to get someone's goat means to irritate them, to make them feel fidgety, uncomfortable, irascible. Um, do you know where it comes from, though? I... I didn't think it could possibly have anything to do with a goat. Maybe a goatee, because, you know, pulling someone's whiskers from their beard, getting someone's goat, you think of a billy goat with its dangling beard, is that what... I always thought that's what it meant, but looking things up for this uh, video, I discovered that it literally means to get someone's goat, a real goat. And this is, this is why. Uh, the most popular gambling sport, of course, is horse racing. And going back into the 19th century, early again, um, lots of horses would get uncomfortable in the stalls ready to go. And what they would do is they would introduce a goat into the stall with the horse because it would calm the horse down um, and then it would run better. And so if you wanted to upset someone else's horse, you would send someone to steal the goat that was in with it. <laughs> to literally get someone's goat. And when you took the goat away, the horse became agitated, anxious, irascible, frantic, and, you know, couldn't be relied upon, may even run the wrong direction. So to get one's goat was to make someone feel anxious. It's taken from the horse uh, riding events and placed on humans, like many things. And I actually heard from someone who uh, works with horses that they still do this at times, where if a horse is being taken in a horse box by a car, they may put a goat in with it to keep it calm. I had no idea. Our penultimate idiom is to give someone the cold shoulder. Now, what does this mean? It actually means to be aloof, to show disdain, uh, contempt even, disregard for someone, to give someone the silent treatment, just the cold shoulder as if you've turned your shoulder to them. 
Now, this actual expression has got some myth about it as well. Some people have heard the story that in medieval days, after the Lord invited many guests to a banquet, if people overstayed their welcome, he would take off some meat from the cold, a cold meat from the shoulder of a pork joint and hand it them as a subtle way to say, could you clear off now, it's time to go. That's um, not true because, I mean, what happens if you don't have a shoulder at the time you've got a leg? It'd be, you know, give someone the cold leg, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, it actually comes from Sir Walter Scott, the writer, from his third book, The Antiquary, which happens, by the way, to be his favourite novel of all that he wrote. Um, and in it, we have a character misquoting, by mistake, the, the Latin from the, the Vulgate translation of the Bible, um, in Nehemiah 9 verse 29, where it talks about um, the children of Israel turned their back upon God. But the, the phrase back should have been translated, uh, the phrase back can sometimes be read as shoulder, which is how Walter Scott had his character say it. And he talked about a woman had a dislike for a man and it started at first by giving him the cold shoulder. It means to turn their back on to look around as you walk away, just like the children of Israel turned their back on God. And that's how it entered into the phraseology of the English language, through The Antiquary by Sir Walter Scott. And he would never have known writing that then, that even today we talk about giving someone the cold shoulder. The final idiom whose origins we want to explore, I've saved for this last post because it's the most hotly disputed one and all sorts of ideas are thrown out there about this. And I know I'm no authority. I'm just going by some research. And it is that great idiom, break a leg. It's what actors say to each other before going on stage, break a leg. And in a weird way, it's wishing them good luck. Now, there are different ideas for this, some of which are more spurious than others. One you may have heard is to break a leg means to break the leg line. There is a line at, at the theatre or the stage where you could be paid if you went on stage. You were sort of a, an ancillary to the theatre company. And if you went past what's called the leg line at the edge of the stage, you entered on the stage, you would get paid. So break a leg, break a leg line would mean, I hope you get some money. Um, although this is accepted by some, it's overall considered quite um, unreliable, except the fact that there's something called a leg line. Um, so that's likely not to be it. Don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. There are two major contending theories, one which is more accepted than another, and we'll come to that in a minute. And they are the linguistic version and the superstitious version of the actual phrase, break a leg. So we'll start with the superstitious one. There was an Irishman called Robert Wilson Lind who wrote a pamphlet called In Defense of Superstition. Um, and he focused on sports because sport is highly superstitious, as if you're a sports fan, you'll know that. Um, people wear the same jersey, don't they? Because they think if they don't, or if they wash their jersey, their team will lose, you know, stupid superstitions. Now, one of the most superstitious sports in its day, the early 20th century, was horse racing. And if you said to a friend, oh, uh, wish your horse good luck, that was tempting fate. It was almost asking fate to now deliberately scupper your horse so you wouldn't win. And so they didn't want you to wish any good on a horse. Instead, it'd be better to reverse psychology with fate and say, I hope your horse breaks a leg. And then fate might intervene and cause the horse to act really well. And that's an idea of where this came from, that to wish ill luck would prevent fate from being tempted to mess up any good performance. And this was passed on to the theater. So break a leg um, by wishing that instead of, I hope you get a standing ovation, you know, you're wishing for something negative in the hope that something positive will happen. It's reverse psychology on fate itself. That's one of the theories. The other theory is non-theatrical in origin and is to do with a transliteration of a Yiddish phrase into German. The German have, Germans have a phrase called Hals und Beinbrock, which means literally like neck or leg break, break a neck, break a leg, but is meant as good luck and still means that today. Where that came from was the Yiddish expression, which I'm going to have to read, which I've got it down here, Hatzlaka Ubraka. Now, I'm obviously not saying that with the correct intonation and everything, but you can see that there is a similarity maybe to the German ear hearing it in Yiddish, Hatzlaka Ubraka and Halsen Beinbrock. 
okay? It may have been comical because in Yiddish, it means goodness and blessing upon you. But for a German hearing it, they know it's supposed to be a blessing, but it sounds like break a leg. And you can imagine how that being humorous would then enter into the language. An interesting thing about this Hard und Beinbruch is that um, Luftwaffe uh, agents, you know, the, the, the officers that flew in the Luftwaffe, the pilots, used to say that to each other before taking off, break a leg. It's got nothing to do with the theatre. Apparently, it's still used in Germany today and still is not constrained to just the theatre. So break a leg. Someone thinks it comes from the Yiddish. Some think it comes from superstition. Um, I don't know which one you personally believe, but nonetheless, a very interesting phrase, break a leg, meaning best of luck. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this brief romp through 10 idioms in the English language and their origins. If you enjoyed this and like this kind of stuff and you want another one, just leave me more comments down below. If I get enough comments, I'll make another one of these because this is all about literature, really. Literature is all about a love of words, about when we talk about form, the shaping of a sentence in order to create an effect. Idioms are just some of the most polished, beautiful turns of expression um, which capture an idea, albeit that idea may be lost to us now, its origin, but it it's caught in such a rhythmic way normally that it trips off the tongue. So going onto the stage and saying, break a leg, or I heard it on the grapevine, it's so colourful, it's so emotional and evocative, as opposed to the stale, precise, cold, clean exactness of scientific and philosophic writing. This is far more human, and that's one of the reasons it's on this channel, because literature is all about words and about human thinking. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video. Please remember to subscribe, and remember that I also have another channel on modern books, if you haven't seen that, I'll put the link down below. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.